Welcome to this special episode of AMSICAST. We're celebrating Nuclear Science Week. It's organized every year by our friends at the National Museum of Nuclear Science and History down in Albuquerque. And of course, activities happen around the country, including at AMSI and Oak Ridge. But we're at the Expo this year. It's held at different cities around the country. This year, it's in San Diego at the Fleet Science Center. Really, really happy to be here and happy to have as our guest now, Rick Lee with General Atomics. Rick, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting us. This is a wonderful event for the students and the general public around here to see ideas and concepts of nuclear energy, yeah. fission, and fusion. It's it's tremendous, and so many kids going through here right now. There are. I've seen you down at your table with lots and lots of uh, students. We have quite a bit of uh, interactives for the kids to yeah. to look at and to work with, so we, we appreciate them being here. It's a big part of what we do at AMSI is, is STEM education, so I'm glad to see glad to see you all so involved in that. T- tell us a bit about General Atomics. What 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 are Where are you based, and, and what are your missions? So General Atomics is a company that... That was born about in the 1950s mm-hmm. from General Dynamics, whose, whose leaders wanted to get more involved with fission and mm-hmm. fusion and to see how nuclear energy, uh, peaceful uses for nuclear energy could be had. I see. I see. And so we're located here in San Diego, yeah. but we're a diverse, diversified company and we have offices throughout the world. I see. So right now, certainly this is the time of nuclear renaissance and fission and great advances in fusion. Uh, so I know we, we spoke a little earlier off camera about fusion. Yes. Uh, w- what is the status of that research and that development, and what what is your specific roles at General Atomics in moving that forward? Right. So I'm a chief operator on the D3D Tokamak. So I'm part of the operations group. Yeah. And uh, the D3D Tokamak is the fourth tokamak in line from uh, uh, the legacy of earlier tokamaks at General Atomics. They've been studying high temperature fusion again since the 1950s, the 60s, Mm -hmm. 70s, 80s, and through to to today. Uh, D3D is the largest operating tokamak of its kind in the U.S. Hmm. And from that we have lots of collaborators from around the country and around the world and we can put out very high end research to answer questions that the fusion community has on how can we make this into a viable, ultimately, electrical producing uh, opportunity. Yeah. So I know I asked, uh, we had Caroline Anderson, Anderson on earlier from the Fusion Industry Association. I said, that, you know, maybe a lot of our listeners haven't thought about fusion at this point. Why, why is it so important? How will it change things once we have that operating and, and part of our daily lives? So some of the key aspects of fusion is it does not produce greenhouse gases. Uh, it does have some radioactive issues, but they're not long-lived as mm-hmm. a fission. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we think that the fuel available uh, that we can get from lithium and the deuterium mm-hmm. that one would use mm-hmm. is readily available. The fuel should last many, many years, tens mm-hmm. of thousands, if not longer. Right. Wow. It will change everything. I think revolutionary it, it, it is the could. word. It yeah. could. Certainly, right. that's the promise of fusion. Right. Now, scientists have been saying that for many, many years. Yes. And it's not right around the corner, but we're getting closer mm-hmm. than we've ever been yeah. to making it a reality. Right. What are the, uh, I know it's a big question, but what are the technological hurdles that right. are so still there? Right. So, the plasma state that we work with, we have to heat it up to about 150 million Kelvin. Oh, is that all? And so... <laughs> <laughs> and that's about 10 times higher temperature than the center of the sun. Oh, my goodness. Now, nature has given us great knobs to turn mm-hmm. in electric fields and magnetic fields in order to hold on to that plasma. Mm-hmm. So we've been able to master that, as, as have other uh, tokamaks in the world. Mm-hmm. But the plasma itself has its own personality. Mm-hmm. So we have to be able to control the plasma down to the millisecond or smaller scale. Right. And so plasma control has come a long way in the last 20 years. Mm-hmm. And that means better computing uh, opp- better computing opportunities that we've had from the mm-hmm. outside world That's and just smarter people that yeah. can learn how to do this plasma control system. Yeah. Another big hurdle, though, is yeah. for making electricity, you have to turn the neutrons that are being produced, take their kinetic energy, and somehow heat up a bucket of water yeah. to make steam. Yeah. Now, between the neutrons being produced and making that steam, you have to have a uh, some kind of a thermal blanket uh, that you can do that with. And so we think molten lithium would mm. be a, a candidate. But mm. research into that and the engineering is still uh, a long ways off. Still underway. All right. So 
you, uh, as I said, you're working with a lot of kids down there at your table today here at Nuclear Science Week. I know we've talked about the importance of STEM. So what would what is your advice to both educators and informal educators like we are at the museum for reaching that new generation and developing the workforce for fission, fusion, other fields in science going down the road? Well, we, we certainly think getting out into the public, such as events like this mm-hmm. and other events, is very important. Have a formal or at least semi-formal program. Mm -hmm. Now, at General Atomics, our research is funded by the Department of Energy. Mm -hmm. And the Department of Energy has programs for undergraduate levels called Mm SULI, Science Undergraduate Laboratory Internship. Mm -hmm. And so that gets the kids that are in the college level not quite sure where they want to go. And they come and for 10 weeks, they study, uh, they have a project that they do, and we get them interested. And for the younger kids, say fifth through uh, twelfth grade, mm-hmm. then we have an opportunity to work with our uh, people here in San Diego. Mm-hmm. We either go out to schools or we have tours at GA yeah. uh, and work with San Diego Festival of Science and Engineering, for example. We were up in Riverside last week where mm-hmm. we performed in front of three groups of 650 kids apiece, wow. as well as being streamed out to thousands of people. Mm-hmm. So we hope to get those kids interested. We want them to know that science and engineering is within their grasp, yep. and we want them to know that it's an interesting, fun career. Mm-hmm. Kind of demystify it a bit and say this is something yes. you can do. Yes, right, right. absolutely. It's so important for us in, in many fields, especially um, in looking at the future of fusion and fission. So where can our listeners learn more about General Atomics and the important work you're doing? So General Atomics can be found simply at GAA.com or on Instagram at at General Atomics. Very good. Well, Rick, I can't thank you enough for joining us in AMSCast. Really enjoyed it and look forward to talking to you more in the future. I appreciate you being here, and I hope to work with you more in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of AMSICast. For more information on this topic or any others, you can always visit us at amse.org or find, like, and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I invite you to visit the American Museum of Science and Energy and the K-25 History Center in person. You can also shop at our online store and become a member at amse.org. Thanks to our production team and Matt Mullins, plus our supportive colleagues at the Department of Energy's Office of Science, Office of Environmental Management, and Office of Legacy Management, as well as Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Y-12 National Security Complex, NNSA, and the AMSI Foundation. And of course, thanks to our wonderful guests today and to all of you for listening. I hope you'll join us for the next episode of AMSICast. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I would like to ask that you consider becoming a member of the 117 Society, the newest membership opportunity offered by the American Museum of Science and Energy Foundation. By joining the 117 Society, you will help us continue this podcast and our other innovative programming. You will support the expansion of our vitally important educational outreach, including virtual classes. And you will help ensure that both the American Museum of Science and Energy and the K-25 History Center can continue to provide world-class exhibits to our community and to the world. Benefits of membership include special access to video and audio content and 117 Society merchandise, as well as all the benefits of our Atom Splitter membership level. To learn more, go to amzi.org. The 117 Society is vital to the future of AMSI and the K-25 History Center. I hope you will consider joining, and thank you very much.